Hey guys, the Files Most Excellent here, and welcome to the second episode of Proving Jesus is God. In the last episode, I talked about the seven places in the New Testament where Jesus is called Theos, which Theos is the Greek word for God. And so he's directly called God in those seven places. And so if you get a chance, check that video out. It's a pretty short one. It's only about eight minutes long. But in today's video, I'm going to show two more places, this time in the Old Testament, where Jesus is also directly called God. Now, you can find many places in the Bible where where he's alluded to as being God, or in a roundabout way he's called God. But in this video, we're going to be talking about places where he is directly called God. And so this video, like the first one, will essentially be on the basic passages that you can go to in the Bible that directly address Jesus as God, and you can use them for counter-arguments against people that you run into who would say that the Bible does not portray Jesus as God. We could be talking about atheists, agnostics, Jewish people, Muslims, those witnesses. This argument comes up a lot from a lot of different types of people. And so these basic passages will prepare you to be able to answer that kind of argument. But the first of the two Old Testament passages that I want to show you is found in Isaiah 7, verse 4. And it reads this way, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. But if we go forward to Matthew chapter 1, we can see what scripture, looking back, thinks about Isaiah 7 verse 14. And starting in verse 21, Matthew says this, She will bear a son, and she there is Mary, Jesus' mother, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And then he quotes Isaiah 7 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then he adds a gloss at the end, he says, which means God with us. And that's what the Hebrew name Emmanuel literally means. It means God is with us or God with us. And so essentially Jesus is being called God here. But before jumping back to Isaiah chapter 7, I just want to point out an argument that you'll sometimes hear against this interpretation, and that is that many people in the Old Testament have the word God in their name. And so like in Emmanuel, L at the end of the word is God in Hebrew. And so there's many people in the Old Testament that have that, like Ezekiel or Joel, which is Joel to us, and many others. And so they'll say that if Jesus is God because the word God is in his name, then all those other people who have God in their name, they're also God. But the refutation of that is actually found right here in Matthew chapter 1. Notice that Matthew says that Jesus' virgin birth is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7. He says that in verse 22. But notice that right before referencing this prophecy, in Isaiah, Matthew, a verse before that, has already told us that the name of the Son is Jesus, not Emmanuel. And so that points to Matthew as viewing the prophecy in Isaiah 7 as being fulfilled not in the fact the Son is called Emmanuel, literally, but that the Son born of the Virgin is Emmanuel, literally. He is God with us. He is God incarnate. He's God come into the world in human flesh. And he makes this even more abundantly clear in the fact that he goes through the trouble of actually trying translating the Hebrew word for us at the end of verse 23. And I mean, if you don't take it this way, that he's viewing Isaiah in that way, it really doesn't make any sense because Jesus only fulfills it in this one way, in the fact that he is God with us. He doesn't fulfill it in the fact that he's called Emmanuel because he's not called Emmanuel. But the real reason that Matthew is calling Jesus God with us and why he's saying that this prophecy in Isaiah 7 has been fulfilled is found in verse 21, where it says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua, shortened form of Yehoshua, which is Joshua. Same name as the book of Joshua. But the name itself literally means Yahweh saves, which Yahweh is just the translation of the Hebrew name of God, sometimes translated translated as Jehovah, but it's just the Lord, the all caps L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. So what Matthew is kind of hinting at here is that Jesus is actually Yahweh. He's the God of the Old Testament. And so when he says, for he will save his people from their sins, he there is Yahweh and Jesus simultaneously. Because Matthew is actually doing a play on words here at the end of verse 21, where he says, for he will save his people from their sins. He's actually drawing from the meaning of Jesus' name and Jesus himself as a person. Because Jesus came to save people from their sins. And 
yet the meaning of his name that was just given to him is Yahweh saves. And so you can see that Matthew is trying to overlap the two here in this play on words at the end of verse 21. But back in Isaiah 7, I just want to point out, you're going to hear an argument very often about the word virgin here. In the Hebrew, it's Alma, which Alma doesn't necessarily mean virgin. It refers to a young maiden, a young woman who is unmarried, and naturally in that culture, that kind of a woman would be considered in almost all circumstances to be a virgin. But Matthew in the New Testament relies upon the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it was translated before Jesus was ever even born. And so I think we can give some credence to the Septuagint and their translation there in just the fact that the people who translated it probably weren't Christians, you know, since Jesus wasn't even born, and they probably weren't biased in that way. They just had that kind of mindset that, oh, an Alma, that refers to a woman who is a virgin. But I'm not going to address the Hebrew or Greek very much. I'll leave a link in the description to a video by a PhD in the Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages, Michael Heiser, and he addresses this very in depth. But I would just point out that you can tell that the word is supposed to be virgin by just looking at the context of this passage. So here in Isaiah 7, let me read the context of what's being said, starting in verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And so I would argue from the context that this must be a virgin. Because first off, the Lord tells King Ahaz to ask for a sign as deep as shale or as high as heaven. That means the greatest sign that he can imagine. He turns him down, but then the Lord says, I'll give you a sign. And so we're expecting something amazing, some kind of great sign. So if this just says, behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son. Uh, that happens all the time. That's not a sign. And actually, if you think about it, that's so far from being a sign that if it happened, no one would even notice. All it's essentially saying is someone's going to have a baby. That's not a sign. No one's going to be able to tell that's even happened. But ironically, the second passage that I want to talk about that proves Jesus is God is found just two chapters later in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And it too talks about a divine son. And this is how it reads. For unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and upon his king to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this and you notice that at the end there the lord is said to perform this kind of like how he said he would perform that sign in chapter 7. So here you have this second divine son in Isaiah, probably the same son, but I want to point out a few things here. First, in verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, but then it says, unto us a son is given. And a lot of people think that this refers to how the pre-incarnate son of God, before he became a man, the father gives him to mankind. And then the reason I read verse 7 and not just 6 was because you can see in verse 7, this is the Messiah, the son of David, because it says that he sits upon the throne of David, and obviously after that, upon his kingdom, his kingdom would be Israel or Jerusalem. And it says that he is established this way from henceforth, even forever. That means that he'll be the king that sits upon David's throne forever. And that is the very definition of the Messiah that God promised to David. But more importantly, to prove that Jesus is God, you can see there in verse 6, he's called the mighty God, that is El Gibor. And if that weren't enough, right after that, he's called the everlasting father, or the father of eternity, meaning he doesn't die, he lasts forever. And I've actually heard people make arguments that this isn't the one true God. It's kind of like how Jehovah's Witnesses will say that John 1-1 is a God and not the one true God. But just let me obliterate that really quick here. If you turn to the very next chapter, chapter 10, and you go down to verses 20 and 21. It says this, In that day the remnant of Israel and the survivors
survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. That's Yahweh there. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. You can see in the context there that the mighty God, El Gibor, same thing as in chapter 9, is here applied to Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. And so there, quite obviously, you have this messianic child. He's being called the mighty God. And just in case there's any doubters out there, I just want to point out really quick that these two verses are in the Isaiah scroll, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that has been found. It's a complete manuscript of the book of Isaiah, and it's been radiocarbon dated four times, and the date is roughly fixed between 300 and 100 years before Christ ever even lived. And so, in the Isaiah scroll, the Messiah is called El Gibor, and then in the very next chapter, Yahweh is called El Gibor. And with that, I just want to thank all you guys for tuning into my video and staying tuned to the very end. And I hope it edified you, and I hope that the Lord will use it to bless you or bless the people that you use the information in this video to reach. And I also want to thank all you guys for subscribing, liking, commenting, sharing my videos, all the love that you guys are giving me. Thank you so much, and just know that I love all of you guys too. And with that, Godspeed, guys.